Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Hahn, the Craig M. Burge Dean of the College, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our second installment of the Spring Faculty Lecture Series. Our goal remains the same, to share our research success and impact with our alumni and friends, you, many of you who generously support the college and have truly helped make this happen. Today's talk is entitled, Team Science in the Era of COVID-19. I've noted before the significant advantage the University of Arizona has over many other universities by having a comprehensive health science center on our main campus. It was certainly a draw in my decision to come to the University of Arizona. For the College of Engineering, this proximity provides opportunity to contribute to research and education around one of our great societal challenges, healthcare. Today, you will meet two of our faculty members that are helping to drive the College of Engineering's collaborations and impact at the intersection of engineering and medicine. And I'm really looking forward to that discussion. Now, looking beyond today's topic of COVID-19 directly, I do wanna mention the first part of the title, namely team science. You know, large interdisciplinary problems cannot be tackled in isolation, but rather they, the ability to respond quickly and successfully to something like a global pandemic requires collaboration from engineers and scientists and physicians. You know, today you will hear about some of UA's efforts to work together to help tackle COVID-19, a disease that has affected all of us to some degree. It's now my pleasure to introduce our two panelists for the day, Dr. Jennifer Barton. Jennifer received her PhD in biomedical, welcome Jennifer, in biomedical engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. She previously worked for McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing Corporation, on the International Space Station. Jennifer is currently the Thomas R. Brown Distinguished Professor in Biomedical Engineering, her home department, and has additional appointments in electrical and computer engineering, medical imaging, optical sciences, and biosystems engineering at the University of Arizona. She has served as Department Head of Biomedical Engineering, Associate Vice President for Research, Interim Vice President for Research, and is currently Director of the Bio5 Institute, a collaborative research institute dedicated to solving complex biology-based problems affecting humanity. Jennifer develops in her own research miniaturized endoscopes that combine multiple optical imaging techniques, particularly optical coherence tomography and fluorescence spectroscopy. She evaluates the suitability of these endoscopic techniques for detecting early cancer development in patients in preclinical models. She has a particular interest in the early detection of ovarian cancer, the most deadly of the gynecological malignancies. Jennifer, welcome. Our second panelist is Dr. Mark Van Dyke. Mark graduated from Central Michigan University with a BS in chemistry and biology. He began his professional career as an analytical chemist at the Dow Chemical Company supporting the US EPA approval of new herbicides before moving to Dow Corning to work in toxicology, silicone biomaterials, and medical devices. He went on to earn his PhD in materials engineering from the University of Cincinnati and then joined Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas, one of the largest uh, uh, research, private research entities in the United States, working on biomaterial development programs, including the development of naturally derived biomaterials and their application to wound healing and tissue engineering. In 2004, he joined the faculty at Wake Forest University School of Medicine, and then in 2012, moved to Virginia Tech, Department of Biomedical Engineering and Mechanics, where his research included investigation of the solution behavior of self-assembly of keratin nanomaterials for a range of biomedical applications. In 2020, Mark joined the University of Arizona. We're glad to have him as our new Associate Dean for Research in the College of Engineering and as a professor of biomedical engineering. Mark has 34 issued US patents and is the co-founder of three startup companies. His teaching interests include regenerative medicine, biomaterials, and healthcare entrepreneurship. Mark, we're glad you have us on the panel as well too. So before we dive into your technical presentation and move into our Q&A along the lines of the topic, let me start with the general question. Um, you know, looking at our educational mission, how might educational institutions such as the University of Arizona keep pace and prepare our students for work in biomedical engineering beyond their university days, including supporting local community efforts, commercial ventures? We'll start with Jennifer and then Mark for follow-up. Jennifer, welcome. 
Great, uh, Dean Han, thank you so much for, for having me on today. And I'm so thrilled to be here. Yeah, the, it's gotten much more complex lately. Students need to have a wide range of skills when they graduate in order to be successful. They need to learn about working in teams, the process of solving real world problems and how to communicate their, the substance and the impact of what they're doing to both scientific and lay audiences. So that's one reason I'm so thrilled about the College of Engineering's Craig Birch Engineering Design Program, because that's going to prepare students to have four years of design curriculum working on real world problems. And in BME, we're especially thrilled to have the Salter Medical Device Design Lab where students can go in, they can learn about the intricacies of solving these problems and how to work with teams, how to communicate. So it's really important that students do these curricular activities, but just as important is that students view their time in college as not only doing what's required for the curriculum, but also co-curricular activities, working in student clubs, volunteering or working in laboratories, working in community engagement, all that will prepare them for the workforce. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And thanks for mentioning two sort of game-changing uh, uh, opportunities we have through the Birch Design Program and the Salter Lab made made available by our alumni. So thank you for mentioning those because they do play huge roles in what we're doing. Mark, what do you think about uh, preparation of our students? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, again, I'm glad to be here as well and uh, welcome everybody. Following up on what Jennifer said, um, you know, I think uh, these interfaces of of science and engineering and um, other areas outside of science and engineering are really important for our students to grasp and gain experience in. Um, in particular, you mentioned commercial ventures. Um, you know, biomedical engineers are natural collaborators. We, we get used to, through our training, working at the interface of uh, biology or life sciences and engineering. Um, not, engineer, not all engineering is that way, but that interface works pretty well. We've gotten really good at that over the last couple of decades. But there are other interfaces where we're not so good at. One of those is, um, is the interface of, of engineering and business. And so again, the, the Craig M. Birch um, program has a thread of entrepreneurship in it. And that's, that uh, is a really important thing, I think, for our students to understand. Engineers are natural problem solvers, but sometimes we can pursue problems that we think are significant or at least interesting to us. And then we learn that we're the only ones that really care if that problem got solved. And uh, so, you know, the, the market and the healthcare system that we have, uh, it's very complex and it, it brings a lot to bear on whether or not the things that we develop as scientists and engineers are actually impactful and can help in the real world. And so to the degree that students understand those things beyond just the pure engineering, things like uh, business and the regulatory environment are really important. So we're developing programs um, to help students get an appreciation and start developing a skill set in those areas as well. Awesome. Well, it's really great to have the two of you guiding our students, not just in the technical aspects of being an engineer, but in the bigger picture. So that's wonderful. All right. So Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you to share your screen and present and present, you know, a, a formal presentation to kind of seed the conversation. When you're done, I believe we're going to shift over to Jennifer, and then we'll come back and go to our Q&A. So, Mark, it's all yours. Okay. So, let's talk about risk and human perception of risk. So, if I show you uh, this picture of a shark, you might say it's a, it's a mean-looking shark, but it's just a picture, so I'm not concerned. But now, if I take you to the ocean and the beach has a sign on it that says, beware of shark, um, the picture of the shark has a different context based on your background and knowledge of sharks. And you may be more concerned. Now, if, I, if we go hiking in Sabina Canyon and we run into a, this sign that says, beware of shark, you're probably not alarmed because you know that there's no sharks in the desert. So the context and our perception uh, of risk as humans is impacted by that situational context. So now let me show you a picture of SARS-CoV-2 virus particle. Uh, it's still just a picture, but your perception of risk is probably heightened because we're in the middle of a global pandemic created by this little particle. Um, with that heightened perception, if I asked you to go to the grocery store and you think about how crowded the grocery store might be, um, then your level of concern about personal risk may increase. 
And as you think of about all of your daily activities, like going to the gas station and going to the gym and maybe even going to class, um, then your level of concern um, may increase. Uh, we still don't know, despite months of intense research, we still don't know enough about coronavirus to provide the context that we need as humans and determine our level of risk. So uh, how can science help? Well, first, we do know a lot about viruses and their biology. For example, we know generally how viruses attach to and enter cells, hijack the internal machinery of the cells, replicate themselves, multiply their numbers, and then uh, leave the cell. But that's only a small part of the story. Uh, outside the cell, we know that in order for infection to spread, the virus has to pass from one person to another. In this case, most likely through the air. Uh, in general, our risk is heightened um, as to whether or not the virus can enter our airway. And as many of us have, have probably learned, this relates to the size of the particle. And terms like droplets and aerosols have, um, have entered our conversations. And so the concept that many people are becoming familiar with is the idea that smaller particles travel farther, stay suspended in the air longer, and can enter more deeply into our airway. So small equals greater risk, uh, which is an important bit of context for us to have as we assess risk. Um, but perhaps we've heard less about how these particles get taken up by a potentially exposed individual, which is another very important piece of context in this particular very complex uh, system. So particle size is very important, but uh, is more detail needed to better understand particle size and context contextualize our perception of risk. And as engineers and scientists, we try to dig into these details. So the short answer is yes, but the specifics of that detail may be different for different people. Scientists think about many things related to the particle it's itself, and I've listed many of them here, including the environment around the particle. And some scientists think about this so much that they've developed ways to describe these details and the behavior of particles in environments with, with math, right? And very complicated looking math. Some scientists have even developed simulations to represent things like particles expelled from an, uh, an infected person. So many of us have seen these popularized simulations on the news. Here are a couple of examples that purport to show what happens when, uh, with coronavirus when someone sneezes. The problem with these simulations is that they, they can be more about mass appeal and less about the underlying science. They can be dramatically oversimplified in order to make a point and to gain an audience. So now imagine that you've seen these simulations of a sneeze traveling 25 feet uh, in distance and you hear someone sneeze in the grocery store. What is your perception of risk then? Probably very high but do you have all the context that you need to act or do you simply just run out of the grocery store? Or do you think about the actual act of someone expelling this, this stuff out of their airway and the parameters that affect that act? Are you thinking about all of the things like the things on this, this list and factoring them into your assessment of risk? Are you thinking about the math? Probably not, right? Um, but beyond the math, it gets even more complicated. Not only do we have simulations, but now we have models, okay? Here are a couple of examples of models that have been popularized. On the right is a YouTube video that has thousands of views. And on the left is a model that's supposed to show how fast COVID can get transferred from one person to another. The problem with both of these models, yet again, though, is that the system is oversimplified. Uh, so what's the solution and how can science help? Um, well, we can make models that uh, begin to, to represent the actual complexity of the system that we need to understand. Engineers are really good at this sort of thing and we often begin with a fairly simple approach uh, called a process diagram. It's a really good place to start, but we need to explore the complexity of the system in order to give an approximate estimate of the risk or at least start to understand the interplay between the different components of the system to determine, for example, what are the factors that contribute uh, most significantly to the risk? So said in a different way, do we worry about the shark in the desert or are we standing on the beach? 
Uh, so we begin to add more complexity. And what emerges is that um, these elements uh, are uh, quite varied and very extensive. And uh, one of the things that should pop out to folks is that um, these areas of, of, of understanding that we need to gain are, are, are require people with different uh, expertise. And so uh, no one person can know all of this stuff. So we need to think about how we can develop an understanding that is bring the proper context into the situation so that we can behave in the most beneficial way. And we can start asking questions and folks with the right expertise can start asking questions. Does it really make sense to run from the grocery store? Or is it possible to give people this information and understanding so that they know uh, not to launch a sneeze 25 feet down the grocery store aisle in the first place? And can we better inform people about how to respond to these sorts of situations? So why is this all important? Um, it's because this level of understanding when generated properly and reliably is important for scientists and for communicating science. Understanding and creating understanding um, is especially in non-scientists, especially in the lay population is really important so that we can inform and influence rather than uh, dictate or manipulate behavior. So I think um, each of us would be more comfortable knowing for ourselves things like, should I run from the grocery store if I he hear somebody sneeze? Or um, can I really stay uh, and uh, work on replenishing my, my stockpile of toilet paper? Um, and if so, if I choose to do that, then what is my risk, okay? Um, it takes a team of scientists to give us that understanding and context. And as laypersons, we need that, especially in a very complicated world with complicated situations like uh, coronavirus. So what are the answers to these and other questions? I don't necessarily know. I, I may not be able to give you them in this um, seminar, but I do know that team science can tell me and you uh, things like whether or not we can reduce our risk of, of COVID, uh, of contracting COVID by uh, simple behaviors that we can all implement in our daily lives as we go to places like uh, the grocery store and, and the gym. So this, pro uh, this proper context can help us make these daily and sometimes moment by moment decisions and then perhaps boost our confidence as we ease into a post-pandemic world. So I'm gonna end there and stop my share and turn things over to Dr. Barton and she is gonna talk about the Bio5 Institute. Great, thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to talk with you as uh, both the Thomas Brown Distinguished Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Director of the Bio5 Institute. So when you think of a scientist or a researcher, is, is this your idea? a crazy person looking through a microscope having a eureka moment all by themselves. Well, well, maybe, and maybe at one point in time that was true. Uh, there's one person can pick up fruit on the ground and can get the low hanging fruit. Um, but this isn't the way it is anymore. As we've heard, team science is really important. This is what teamwork looks like nowadays. Teamwork wins. It's well proven that the diversity of teams is really important. Papers put out by groups of people who are diverse, both in terms of their discipline, in terms of their gender, their nationality, their race, ethnicity, their background, their cultures. Papers that are put out by teams that are diverse have been proven to have higher impact than papers that are put out by teams that are more homogeneous. So if we work together, we can get to that bulk of the fruit and the sweet fruit is the very top of the tree. So I've said that, so you may be thinking, great, teamwork is great, how come everybody isn't doing it? Well, I'll tell you, it's hard. Teamwork is really hard. The first time that I went as an engineer and sat down with a cancer biologist, I think both of us were about in tears by the end of the conversation because we just don't even have the same vocabulary to work from. It takes time, it takes effort to work across those disciplines and it's hard to do by yourself. So that was the idea of creating the Bio5 Institute. The Bio5 Institute is a collaborative research institute that works across the entire university to bring people together and help facilitate team science. I like to ask, where does the Bio5 come from? Where's the five? Uh, the first five is the disciplines involved, including engineering, medicine, pharmacy, science, and agriculture. 
But you know, there's lots of other fives. There's researchers, students, community, industry, and government. And so if we think it's hard just to work within the university, how do we work outside the university as well? So the Bio5 Institute was created and funded by the university. And we said, anybody who wants to do team science, come here. So this is an opt-in institute. We have 300 members working actively across disciplines from 12 colleges, 68 departments. So we've got a great team of people. All these people wanted to come together and our job and my fun job as director of the Institute is to help these people work together to solve big problems, get to the top of the tree. So some facts about the Bio5 Institute. Our budget is about $8 million a year, and that comes from the state and from the University of Arizona. It comes from donors, and it comes from you all who are in state who are paying sales tax. Thank you very much. That's the Technology Research Infrastructure Fund, or TRIF, which funds a lot of our work. What do we spend that money on? Well, things that promote team science, things that help solve these big problems. First of all, we want to recruit people like Dr. Van Dyke here. So faculty recruitment is part of what we do. Um, we have seed grants. The federal funding agencies are, they're, they're just very conservative. They want to know that it, not only do you have a great idea, but is your great idea likely to work? So they're not likely to fund an idea until you have some feasibility data. Well, how do you get that? We'll give you a seed grant. You wanna have an engineer work with a physician to work on a new medical device? We can give you a seed grant to show that that device is possible. And then the federal agency will come in and give you a device, give you more funding in order to improve Prove that device and test it in patients. We have events. We bring people together. If you want to know everybody on campus and maybe across the country who are working on a specific area, we can have an event for that. Infrastructure. You need good laboratories. You need good equipment. Staff support and equipment support. We have governance, so we don't work in a vacuum. Uh, I report to the Senior Vice President for Research, but we have a Dean's Advisory Board, an external advisory board and faculty committees to make sure that we are picking the areas to focus on that are going to be of most impact to the University of Arizona, to the state of Arizona and to the world. And I think we've done a pretty good job with those, those funds that we have. Uh, when we look back, depending on how you want to calculate it, we have somewhere between an eight and an 18 times return on investment in terms of sponsored research coming back into, uh, you generally that's federal funds that are coming back into the state of, of Arizona. And just last year, our really creative members came up with 67 disclosures, 13 patents and three startups. Our infrastructure is available for faculty across the University of Arizona. We have two buildings that are flexible, flexible space, not only just lab space, but interaction space, conference space. And then both buildings house many core facilities that attract faculty from across campus, core facilities that are equipment that's too expensive for any one faculty member to have. But it's not just for faculty. These are open to industry as well. And we're proud to support a lot of the smaller industry here in Tucson that wouldn't necessarily be able to afford these pieces of equipment either. We engage students, so not only, we understand the, the importance not only of bringing faculty today together, but creating the faculty and the researchers and the industry workers of the future. So in last fiscal year, we enabled the training of, of over a thousand undergraduate, graduate students and postdocs, as well as high school students, preparing them to enter the workforce. For instance, our keys high school research internship program brought 50 high school students to do a, last year it was a virtual, and this year it's going to be virtual again, but eventually we'll get back to hands-on as well to provide them with real world, out, real world applications and, and teach them these critical scientific skills. We also have postdoctoral fellowships. So the, the full line, we're preparing people to be successful, whether they go into industry or academia. So with that background, then what's happened? So over the past 19 years of this technology research infrastructure fund, 
we've been investing in building critical facilities and research services that you know we've been building them up and building them up and they've been doing great work but they've really been put in the spotlight this year with the COVID-19 crisis. What are these things that we've spent money on that are all of a sudden needed? Well, a biosafety level three facility. If you wanna work with the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you need to work in a very, very specialized facility and we have that available. Good laboratory practices media facility. You may have heard about the shortage of swabs, the shortage of just that liquid that you put the swabs into before you go do tests. So we pivoted very quickly to creating the correct media for testing. Access to clinical samples being able to get the samples we needed to sequence the genome of this virus. Biostatistics and data handling capability, there's a huge amount of data being generated. A CLIA lab, which just is a fancy name for meaning we're certified actually to run clinical tests. Mouse models for testing therapeutics, but really the most important research was having these over 300 engineers, scientists, and physicians who are already ready to work together, many of whom um, immediately pivoted and focused their research on this important virus. So what did we do? Well, with, with that information, with seed funding from the Bio5 Institute, we've created specimen collection kits, antibody testing, apps to help reduce stress and loneliness, drug treatment discoveries, all kinds of great things have happened. And I hope that you all may have had a chance to read this article in the alumni magazine about what Bio5 researchers were doing to fight the pandemic and all the men, multiple groups that are working on things. Um, but I'd like to highlight just a couple engineers in particular. So a fantastic team, Dr. Vignesh Subian from Systems Industrial Engineering and Biomedical Engineering, working with Jared Moiser uh, from, over from the Department of Medicine in order to understand why do some patients get really sick and why do some patients not? How can we create the data, collect the data and analyze the data to find out what it is about this patient population so we know in advance who we should treat very aggressively. And another example, example Dr. Zhang Il Yun has created a smartphone-based COVID-19 test that can potentially give you an answer to whether or not you're infected in 10 minutes. Wouldn't that be great? Right on your smartphone. So he's been working very diligently, him and his trainees, in order to get this test up and running and make it very low cost and very rapid. Dr. Judy Sue is working on how do we increase the sensitivity of this test? You may have heard about how some tests are more sensitive than others. Well, how do, can we create the most sensitive test possible? Dr. Sue's device is orders of magnitude more sensitive than other items out there. So she can detect infection at the very earliest stages. All these people working together, none of them have worked by themselves. They've all worked together with their teams of people that they've developed. So what's the current state? What's the future state? Well, weekly COVID-19 tests of students, staff, and faculty are being run at the Bio5 Institute, keeping our campus safe. Researchers are working in labs with safety precautions. It's actually been, um, we're probably up to about 90% of where we were pre um, pandemic in order with the, the lab research that's going on. People are being very careful. Team science, you know, there's always silver lining. Um, team science is thriving with remote interactions. All of a sudden, people that we thought were too far away to work with, we realize now that doesn't really matter. There's a new willingness to share early data, which I think is just fabulous for the whole scientific community. Bio5 is conducting virtual workshops and community engagement activities. But we do hope to see everyone in person soon so we can get back to these wonderful pictures taken in the summer of, of 2019 of our science city. So thank you. With that, I will end sharing and turn it back over to Dean Hahn. Thank you, Jennifer. And again, thank you, Mark. Very, set the stage really nicely. Um, I'm going to start with you, Jennifer. You did talk a lot about Bio5 Institute. You gave us a nice background on that as a collaborative facility. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Bio5 Institute and the facilities as, as an asset to this university and how it you know, helps our education and research missions, particularly in the College of Engineering in, in, in some very significant ways? Yes, so 
Bio5 exists to serve the community and bring people together. We have no agenda of our own. Oh, we're, we're here. And I think one of the things that I heard a lot when I first came to the University of Arizona 22 years ago was that engineers have fantastic ideas. We're really good tool builders, really really good people, great at design, and they really want their work to have impact. They want to improve health and well-being of people. And uh, I'd have people coming to me all the time saying, I've got a great idea. I think this can really help in the medical field, but I don't know where to go. And that's exactly what Bio5 has been set up for, is to help be that bridge. Um, and I think one of the best examples is being a bridge between the College of Engineering and the College of Medicine in terms of taking great ideas and turning them into products that help patients. Excellent. No, that's, I, 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 I see it the same way. Thanks for putting that out there to the community too, that this is a resource that they can come to. Um, Mark, I'm going to go to you. Mark, you touched on the aspects of COVID-19 disease spread in the context of an aerosol. Um, masks have become a huge part of our efforts to stop the spread. Do, do you see the use of masks continuing well into the future, you know, even as vaccines become more prevalent from a bioengineering perspective? Yeah, I do. And, and some people may be disheartened to hear that because I think one of the things that we're all looking forward to is the day that we kind of shed our masks. But, but I think it's gonna change. Um, you know, the masks have been a, been a, a political issue and a fashion statement and, and a variety of things. And I think where science can help is we can get it back to the science. There's actually strong rationale for what we can and should be doing um, with regard to, to public health. And so I think we'll see, and we're already seeing it really, innovations in new materials and new design uh, and new behaviors that will have uh, a much um, more in-depth uh, rationale and understanding for those. And then as we communicate that to our, our constituencies, again, to the folks who don't do this for a living and properly rationalize why those things are important, uh, then I think we'll see it be adopted as a, as, a, as a health practice rather than, for example, a fashion state. Very good, very interesting. Jennifer, I'm gonna to go to you and pull one right out of this, just submitted a, a few minutes ago from a UA engineer and, and someone who's worked in the hospital industry as a CEO, um, go cats, we're proud of that. Um, how, how is our biomedical program working with employers in healthcare industry? In particular, do you have areas of, in particular areas of greatest need like rural critical access and are we, you know, doing internships and partnerships out in that larger community. Yeah, I, that's a, absolutely critical. And I think that's one place that engineers can take what we have, you know, perhaps initially billed as being a resource that's only ava available to specialty hospitals and making that affordable and portable and robust in the field. And that's what's really critical. So people like Dr. Zhang Yilyun making smartphone enabled devices, uh, sensors, uh, Marv Slepian making sensors, wearable sensors that can be on people where they are not, having having to bring the people to the hospital, bringing the healthcare to the people. So uh, telemedicine, that's another important area. And we do actually have a very robust telemedicine uh, network here in the state of Arizona. In terms of partnerships, that's an area I see as being a, a great opportunity. In fact, uh, there's a, a, a center for, for rural health and there's also many other initiatives that where I think engineering can get engaged um, and we are putting together a training program that will have people actually go out into more rural communities and, and learn, you know, some people who've never been there, learn what the unique needs are and how to satisfy them. Good. And I'm just going to stick with you for a second. We've got a couple of questions come in. Are, are we in Bio5 collaborating with any other universities, um, you know, that you might be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this, this TRIF funding was to the entire state of Arizona. So our closest collaborators are, are Arizona State University and, and Northern Arizona University. So there's the Biodesign Institute, AASU, and there's many researchers up at NAU that we work with. But of course, we do also work with people across the country and across the world and uh, understanding that we can help facilitate those connections and, and bring those people here, learn from them, work with them and expand the impact of what we do. Excellent, thank you. Mark, um, you know, back to COVID-19, 
there's a lot of interest in some of the pre-submitted questions um, about the science or biochemistry of COVID-19. Go back to your undergraduate days as a chemist and biologist. Can you give any insight into how fast can we develop antibodies against mutated versions of SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, it's it's a really uh, interesting question, and I think um, you know most a lot of people may not realize that we actually can do the molecular biology really quickly. For us to be able to figure out, for example, the um, the genome. Of, of a virus is actually pretty simple because their genome is so much more simple than other organisms. Um, and then inferring from there what, what, their, uh, what the proteomics looks like. So that molecular biology level kinds of things, we can actually figure that out pretty quickly. But the, the process of taking those discoveries and turning them into an effective treatment in our healthcare system, that's the part that really takes the long period of time. So when you think about doing something like developing an antibody therapy, um, the, the actual biochemistry and molecular biology piece of it is pretty quick within, within uh, even sometimes weeks to months. And um, the, the long, much longer piece of it, and people ask questions about like, um, how are we able to develop this vaccine so quickly? And is it safe? Because, you know, obviously they must have cut some corners. Um, they had, didn't necessarily cut corners. It's just that uh, the science can come along very, very quickly, but then there is a really long journey to the marketplace, right? There's a really long journey to actual implementation. And you have all these other stakeholders that are involved in that process, the regulatory agencies, there's manufacturing considerations, there's distribution. There's a, there's a financial incentive there, right? There's people taking, companies taking significant financial risks in terms of will they be able to recoup their investment. That's the longer piece of it. And so what we did in the case of the, uh, of the vaccine development um, is that we took a lot of that out of the system and we incentivized companies to do the things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. I think a really interesting question is, what are things gonna be like going forward? Now that we're, we've shown that we can do this, what does the future hold? Are we going to be able to continue optimizing that, what, what has become a very lengthy and very expensive process? Now we've shown that we can do it. Are we gonna to continue to be able to optimize it going forward? Good, good question. And kind of playing on optimization, you know, take that a little further to Jennifer. We hear a lot about big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Have you observed any of your colleagues using these tools directly in response to COVID-19? And if not COVID-19, do you see other exciting areas in, in the Bio5 you know, community around healthcare and biomedical that are using AI, ML, those types of things? Yes, in fact, I, I think we're gonna have to move our bar of what's big data because there's just, you know, almost everything is big data nowadays. So from the work that Dr. Subian is doing, trying to understand which patients get critically ill, can we just take as much information we, as we know about those patients, their health history, their genetics, can we, um, figure out a, a machine learning solution to how that data turn into their outcomes. Um, another way that was done was just really exciting, sequencing the genome of this virus. You've heard about the mutations. It's mutated in small and large ways on the path. And so you can actually follow by doing uh, big data work. You can, you can take the specific gene mutations that a virus that a person has today, and you can trace back exactly how that virus progressed across the world and where it came from. And so it's just amazing the work that we can do with um, you know, really strong computational tools and um, various cyber infrastructures that we have available nowadays to understand more about COVID-19. And I won't even get into everything else because we'd be here all day. <laughs> Good, that's, that's excellent. Mark, um, you know, again, kind of to this team science and multi based on our multidisciplinary response to COVID pandemic and lessons learned, do you, know, do you believe we, be, we will be able to prevent future pandemics with what we've learned from this pandemic over the last year? I'm asking you to extrapolate a little bit. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a natural optimist, so I, I think so, yes. Um, will, will we be able to, um, to, to, do a much, much better job in terms of global pandemic, yes. 
um, I think we'll see, you know, in the future, um, you know, regional, local and regional kinds of, of outbreaks. Um, but if you look at um, the science behind this one in particular, um, coronaviruses have been known for a long, long time. And, and this particular virus, its, it's uh, infectiousness and the severity of that infection um, was actually uh, shown in a mouse model back in 2015. And, uh, and so um, we know a lot about uh, you know, these sorts of diseases, um, the, where we fell down, I think is, is a, a lot of the worldwide communications and the messaging and the, uh, the ways in which we inform people and, and ask them to adapt, uh, their behavior. And then, like I said before, we've got this machinery that we have to embrace once the initial discoveries are made that actually is the longer piece of getting something from the laboratory into people's arms, for example. Um, and I think, again, we've shown ourselves that we can do that in a much more effective and efficient way. So I think across the globe, people have risen to the challenge and shown ourselves and each other that we can really do these things and it will only improve over time. So I'm really optimistic about the fact that we'll be able to handle these things a lot better in the future, not completely wipe them out, but handle them much, much better. Good, awesome. And kind of staying on that theme and, and, and even grabbing a little bit of a, of a real time question, Jennifer, kind of playing on this that we've learned a lot from COVID response. What are the opportunities for you and your biomedical engineering you know, colleagues looking forward to really provide biomedical engineering solutions to this pandemic and as we've tried to move quickly, as you've demonstrated, are we learning a little bit more about risk taking? You know, biomedical devices are very conservative in nature. So are we a little more comfortable moving quicker and learning as we go? So that's kind of two questions in one, but um, I, I, I like the audience's submission about risk taking and the biomedical response to these kinds of things. Yeah, well, biomedical engineers can, can shine in the area of devices and therapeutics, but I think where we, we really excel is in diagnostics. And uh, engineers, we're fortunate that we have a whole institute at NIH, the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. Um, and they saw really very early in this process, the opportunity to employ their incredible network of biomedical engineers to provide better diagnostics. So they launched the RADx program, the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics. And this is a good way of balancing speed and risk because what they did was almost just like a shark tank type of process where they put out a lot of um, small sums of money to a lot of different ideas to come up with different diagnostics, knowing that we're gonna get to the point of needing to run hundreds of thousands or even millions of tests a week here in the United States for the foreseeable future. We've got to come up with, with point of care ones. We've got to come up with ones for the hospitals. We've got to come up for ones at your local CVS. Just, you know, all different things. They funded about 50 different projects. And then they saw which one of those succeeded and gave the winners increasingly larger sums of money to the point where several of the devices that they funded are already FDA approved or under emergency youth authorization and out there and being deployed. So they didn't lower their standards at all in terms of safety, in terms of you know expecting that these tests have good sensitivity and specificity, but they were able to move very rapidly. So I would say, um, that you know, maybe what we've learned is to take a little more risk in what we fund rather than you know, risk in terms of safety. I don't think that is gonna change. I think that's, that's very significant too, right? Because there's often been the, the take in NIH if you almost have to do half the work before you'll get funding. So they've opened that up a little bit and that sounds like that's been very impactful for you and your colleagues. So that's great. Um, thank you for that insight. Mark, I'm going to step a little bit beyond COVID-19 and focus more on the other portion of this talk, team science. Um, you know, as our associate dean for research, you know, you're tasked with helping to shape our college's strategic research directions. How does interdisciplinary collaborative research shape that strategy as you're helping us move in this, in particular, the intersection of engineering and medicine? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think um, if, if all we did was, was chase funding, 
um, that would be a bad strategy, right? I, I think that um, we're at our best when we are chasing impact, and and then the rest follows. If you're if you're chasing impact, if you want to work on big problems and important things, all the, all the rest of that will follow. Opportunity will follow. Funding will follow. Um, and and uh, critical mass, and you'll draw people to those sorts of things. And going after those kinds of things, seeking that impact, going after those big problems, it necessitates that you do things in a very interdi interdisciplinary way. Um, you know, and it's kind of funny we use that term a lot, interdisciplinary, but it can mean different things to different people. When I was at Wake Forest, I had what I considered to be an interdisciplinary group. I had students who were coming from the life sciences. I had um, students who were studying neuroscience and molecular biology, as well as different varieties of engineering. You go to some other laboratories and their multidisciplinary definition is, I have a biomedical engineer and I have a mechanical engineer and I have an electrical engineer. Um, and so, you know, my, 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 my preference is, is the former. I think you need to bring all of those people together and you can attract the interest and the passion that people have when you go after big important things. If people understand that, that uh, what they're doing is trying to solve these big, uh, you know, sticky problems, um, then they're naturally gonna find ways to go above and beyond when working together. Yeah, that's good. It seems like the, 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 the bar keeps rising. We talked about multidisciplinary and now it's interdisciplinary and now it's transdisciplinary is the, is the new future, right? So we gotta keep, keep evolving. Jennifer, you helped stand up our biomedical engineering program, and it, it's really become a, a, a great part of this college. How has the BME curriculum evolved since your PhD studies? And you know, what are key updates coming in the near future to help prepare the sort of next generation of biomedical engineers? BME I, has really come into its own lately. Uh, when I was an uh, undergraduate, there were very few biomedical engineering undergraduate programs. So my, my own background is in electrical engineering. And indeed, as a, as a PhD student, uh, we tended to learn about the body as being modeled by a set of resistors. Um, and that's, that, that's fantastic. But DME is really about the, the fusion of engineering and medicine and biology together. So understanding that that is its own discipline. So we can learn about mechanics, but the human body doesn't behave necessarily like a cantilevered beam. You know, there's soft tissue mechanic, mechanics are very different. Um, the fluid mechanics of blood are very, very unique. So there's an understanding of how those unique biological factors can be employed in an engineering context. The other thing is to think about what biology does, biology is very complicated and it, it resists kind of being modeled as a simple set of equations. Um, but engineers, we can apply our discipline to biology and we can provide some context to that. Um, one of the things that used to happen in my own field is that we would do, uh, say for instance, a laser treatment of a tissue. And then we'd say, oh, and then a miracle occurs and the body heals itself. Um, nowadays, we understand that those two things have to be coupled. The, the engineering intervention and the uh, biological response need to be managed together. So that's, I think, where the state of biomedical engineering is today. I think in the future, there will be even better recognition of what a biomedical engineer is and what kind of unique skills they can bring to a team. Biomedical engineers are always going to work in a team. You're not going to have a company that's only biomedical engineers. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Kind of staying a little bit on the topic of education, the recruitment of top graduate students is, is very important to our entire college, certainly to the biomedical engineering program. Um, I, I'm going to ask each of you to comment on the attractiveness of this type of research that we've talked about today to students in your own recruitment experiences. Um, we'll start with you, Mark, and then we'll go to Jennifer. Yeah, I think it's critical, you know. Um, as, as many folks who've gotten to know me over the, my, my first few months here know, uh, I've been a very traditional faculty member um, prior to this, running my research program and teaching courses and all that sort of stuff. So um, recruiting students into my research group. I've never had a student sit across the, the desk from me and say, 
you know, I want to go to graduate school because I, I want to publish uh, six papers and, you know, uh, get a fellowship grant and um, present a paper at a, at a scientific meeting. You know, they come to your office and they talk to you because they want, they, they dream big and they want to do big things, right? Uh, they want to have an impact. They want to make a difference in the world. Um, these types of activities and this type of research, these types of environments, they give students the opportunity to do that. And it's a big challenge for us as, as mentors and advisors and teachers to give students those kinds of opportunities. Um, we have to rise to that challenge. And, and these sorts of environments and, and uh, research projects um, are, are perfect for attracting those types of students. Um, we have to we have to compete uh, because there's there's other programs out there as well and students look at a lot of things when they make those uh, sorts of decisions um, but this to me is kind of the perfect arena in which to draw in those types of students because um, the potential for impact in this particular field is enormous good thank you yeah i think it, i agree with you i think the students will be really excited about moving into these areas I'm kind of looking back at, at questions that have been submitted. You now go back to COVID-19. I'm going to look to Jennifer. You know, what is the current thinking about, you know, immunity and how long that will last? And we talk about variants. You know, I realize, Jennifer, you're not a, uh, a virologist, but, you know, you're, uh, we look to you for advice. So if you want to share any thoughts on what you've heard from your colleagues or kind of your understanding of, of what this means, that'd be great to share. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not a virologist, but one of the advantages of Bio5 is that one of the associate directors is, um, is uh, worked on viruses all his life, going back to the Spanish flu. Um, and he's been right so far. So I will take what he says, um, yeah, Mike Moraby, as, as um, guidance for going forward. Um, the, as the, the virus progresses, it will have genetic mutations that will lead to these different variants. And so far, the data have been very positive that the uh, vaccines that are out there appear to provide at least partial protection against all the new variants. And really importantly, they provide protection against severe disease. So even if you still get it, um, then the, the unlikely to be hospitalized. So I think um, the, the, the virologists I know are actually optimistic and they don't tend to be optimistic people. So I think that uh, vaccination uh, is, is, does appear to be working. So I certainly encourage people to go get vaccinated as they are able to and as the supply allows. And I think that is going to be our ultimate way that we're going to manage this disease. Excellent. Thank you for again sharing your thoughts and yeah, drawing on the expertise of Bio5. Um, again, I'm going to go back to some of the big picture of this with team science and such. You know, our college has plans for greater involvement with the health sciences, including we're exploring a stronger collaboration with the Cancer Center. So I'm going to ask Mark to first comment on ways that engineers can help in the battle against cancer. Big picture. Then I'll go to you, Jennifer, and and you know, noting in your introduction, you're actually working on cancer detection. So I ask you to elaborate a little more on what you're doing and as an engineer and, and, and the potential of this area. So Mark, to you. Um, yeah, there's, this is actually a really rich area for, um, for engineers because um, cancer is very complicated, right? It's another one of those big sticky problems. And what we've learned in recent years that it, it's more than just the cell, cell and molecular biology, right? Tumors, um, have uh, a, a number of different um, factors or elements um, that make them what they are, that make them dangerous for us as, as human beings. Um, one of the areas that, that engineers particularly have gravitated to is the, um, the environment surrounding the, the cells. So not the cell molecular biology or the stuff that is inside the cell, but the stuff outside the cell. Right? There's a matrix that surrounds these cells that uh, creates that tumor. So that's materials engineering, um, that extracellular matrix, uh, those, are, those are molecules and materials that material engineers um, understand really, really well. Um, there's also a mechanical environment, a fluid environment. So all of these things outside the cell um, are very well understood in engineering by different types of engineers. So people that study mechanics, for example, 
we've opened this whole new field called uh, mechanobiology, where we're beginning to understand the influence of the out, outside mechanical environment, how it has on the cell and how those signals, those mechanical signals may be uh, imparted and cause uh, uh, changes within the cell. So this coupling again of, um, of an engineering principle like uh, the, the, uh, the external mechanical environment and mechanical forces then gets coupled in some way to the biological environment and then can actually transduce signals into the cell to, to change things like uh, exacerbate things like um, metastasis. Excellent. And Jennifer, you know, again, kind of continuing on the role that engineers can play in this battle on cancer. Do you want to share some of your own experiences and, uh, you know, what motivates you in this area? I'm motivated by the fact that cancer is, is curable or manageable if it's caught early. Uh, and if it's caught late, then, then the um, survival goes down. So what can we do to detect cancer early? And it, it takes both things. It takes a better understanding of the cancer biology that our, our colleagues are doing over in the cancer center, but it takes advances in technology. So I'm super excited because every time new technology advances come out, better fibers, better materials, smaller cameras, cheaper lasers, then I use those and put them into my work. And my idea is to take optical imaging technologies, make them tiny, make them inexpensive, make them minimally invasive. Let's make these tiny endoscopes and peer into the body and detect that cancer early. Because if we can detect that cancer early, we can maybe right then and there just zap it or cut it out and, and it won't ever go anywhere. So uh, the, the synergy between the understandings of how cancer develops and the understanding of all the tools we have that you know mainly is driven by industry industry is creating these better tools. And so we take them, I bring them into my research and that's, that's what excites me every day. That's great. That's really great and impactful. Kind of getting to the end, I'm going to give you both kind of a, a crystal ball question for, you know, about a minute each. So let's look forward 20 years from now. Um, you know, what problems you think might be well in hand in the biomedical engineering area and then what new challenges may have opened up? Um, I'll go to Jennifer and then Mark. I think what's going to be uh, the, the biggest challenge going forward is we understand as a population how to do medicine, but how can we make it personalized? Uh, there's been a lot of work on that, but I think that we're just really going to blossom in the next couple of decades where we understand how, how my lifestyle, how my genome, how my activity level, how my diet, you know, how do all those things interact into keeping me as well as possible? much, much in, more interested in increasing quality of life than simply just quantity. We both would be great, but how do we keep ourselves as healthy as possible and as active as possible mentally, physically, emotionally for the longest lifespan and well span? Fantastic. Mark? Yeah, I think one of the concepts that really struck me when I started in this field a long, long time ago is, is how um, you know, folks think at a systems level and um, you know, kind of going off what Jennifer said, uh, when you think about lifelong health and, and quality of life, you have to think about a plan that does it's very individualized and it spans an entire lifetime. There are things that if you monitor them throughout a lifetime, you're going to generate a ton of data. That's where data science comes in. But but you can you can see things and head them off much more readily when you have a systems approach. When you have a large, when you have large data sets that you can work with, and so all these, what's really exciting is all these pieces are coming together. We're getting much, much better at looking at individuals and and components of individuals. We're getting much better at looking at data and using data in ways that we haven't in the past. And the thing that really excites me is that um, we're teaching people at a much earlier age. This is where we, you know, do things at the undergrad level, for example teaching students how to think about how we can take these discoveries into the marketplace. That's where the entrepreneurship stuff comes in. I'm really excited about the stuff we're doing here in that regard too. Excellent. You know, to Jennifer's comment on personalized medicine, things that I think are exciting are, you know, with the cancer fund, again, the ability to maybe take someone's cells out, grow them in a very realistic tumoroid environment, hit it with the different drugs, a whole array, thousands of wells, 
and then come back and have this customized treatment. So I think there's some really neat things happening on these fronts. I think we've come to the top of the hour. So I want to thank Jennifer and Mark for a fantastic discussion. I mean, um, I, I, everyone is stuck with us as I've watched our participants. I hope everyone has learned something. We've tried to answer most of your questions. If we didn't get to them and you're, you're remain interested, email me or Mark or Jennifer and uh, we'll carry on a dialogue. Thank you both. Thanks everyone for joining us. I hope to see you back in a week. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.